Go for it. All right, everyone. This talk is going to be on uh, how to run Kubernetes on your spare hardware at home and save the world by Angus Lees. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Angus. Angus has done all sorts of things with computers. All of it, yeah, surprising. All of it revolving around Linux and free software. He was search on call during Google's second biggest web search outage. Did you course it though? No, that okay. was a malware outage. Everything got marked as malware. That was a fun weekend. <laughs> yeah. Gus has driven through the great sandy desert to install Linux two-way satellite routers on poles. He uploaded one of the first native apps to the Android marketplace, ScumVM. His home was the first place in the world to receive a quad A response from Google.com. He was interviewed by Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne, born as uh, in preparation for the first Matrix movie. And while working on OpenStack, Angus accidentally became one of the earlier upstream Kubernetes contributors and currently works full-time on Kubernetes and related tools as a senior developer with Bitnami. Gus is also a really nice guy. He's a personal friend of mine, and uh, more often than not, he is the smartest guy in the room. So can you put your hands together and give a warm welcome for Angus Lees. Yeah, it's um, a little bit of a funny story, mostly an accident. I was working for Google for quite a while, and then I got bored of that and wanted to do something else. So I went to Rackspace to work on OpenStack. Um, and it was right at the time, I came out of Google, I said, right, well, I know how to run programs in, on multiple machines, you do something like this. And then I wanted to learn about OpenStack, so I, from, from a distance, OpenStack looks like a similar set of problems. It's a bunch of Python web servers that talk to MySQL databases. And I was like, well, I know how to run a bunch of programs uh, on multiple machines. You do something like this. <laughs> so I just happened to be, at that time, Kubernetes had only just sort of come out. It was just making, making some uh, names around the place. So I, I'd heard of this project, so tried it out and tried to get OpenStack deployed on Kubernetes um, way before either project was ready for it. But um, for me, really, the goal was to learn about OpenStack uh, and the architecture of it, and um, on the side to learn a little bit about this Kubernetes project that I'd heard about. So um, uh, I wrote a bunch of patches and did some things to help that work. And because I was working for Rackspace, I had access to the Rackspace public cloud cluster. That was the infrastructure that I had to work with. Um, and that uh, is an OpenStack instance, OpenStack cloud. And so I was running, trying to run OpenStack on Kubernetes on OpenStack uh, way before that was a thing people talked about. Uh, and so I wrote a bunch of code in Kubernetes that knew how to talk to OpenStack. And I wrote a bunch of some flannel plugins. I wrote a whole bunch of things um, to try to make that work. And it didn't, didn't go anywhere. I learned what I wanted to learn. The whole thing didn't work, but that was OK. And so I left it. And then about a year later, I was at something unrelated talking to some people. And they're like, oh, yeah, we've been using this code. And I started getting bug reports from people. I was like, what? what? People are using this? <laughs> like, this never works. What do you mean? <laughs> um, and so then I had to fix it up. So um, uh, for a long time, uh, I was responsible for the part of the Kubernetes code base that knows how to talk to OpenStack. So it's got a cloud provider plugin sort of architecture, and it knows how to talk to Amazon and, and Google Compute Engine. Um, and then OpenStack was the third one. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other ones now, um, a lot of them based on the OpenStack. Uh, code module. Uh, and then up until about the last 12 months, I was pretty much solely responsible for that bit of code uh, and maintaining the bit of code. Um, so just an accident of timing that I happened to be involved really quite early on in, in Kubernetes. It was released in version 0.5 in like 2014. That was where that chunk of code got merged upstream. Anyway, uh, this talk really is not actually a talk about Kubernetes. Where does that go to the next slide? I said next slide. Hang on a sec while I focus the things. Press the button, that'll do, right. This is not really a talk about Kubernetes. It looks like it is, but really it's a talk about free software. And I'm really glad I'm following uh, Karen's keynote this morning because it's uh, very much a, a, a those ideas um, applied to here. So I want to talk a little bit about the context uh, and really what the subtext of this talk uh, is about. Once upon a time, computers looked like this, um, or bigger, <laughs> and 
we had a model where you had multiple users logging into one machine. You had, you had mainframes, you had shell accounts, you had you know, X windows as an actual remote network protocol, all these sorts of things where you had multiple users, typically in a university setting, um, sharing a small number of large computers. And this was really the, the, the Unix heydays. This was the big, the classic era of Unix. Um, and we had all of those brands we know about, you know, digital um, equipment and, and Solaris and all these sorts of things. And, and big machines, lots of architecture, lots of Unix. Um, then along came PCs. Hardware got cheap. Hardware got to the point where everyone had their own computer. You know, we got to the, the $1,000, $2,000 sort of price point. Um, and so we went to sort of this model. Everyone, there was one person, one computer, a personal computer. Uh, and this is where Linux really came in, because you know, at this point we were driving price down and everyone could experiment with their own hardware, they could reinstall it themselves, all these sorts of things that you couldn't do with a big shared computer. So this is really where Linux suddenly took off, was this sort of era. Uh, and then, and this, yeah, cheap, plentiful computers. And then as businesses kept wanting to do more with their computers, they wanted uh, more reliability, more availability, had to keep working all the time, they had bigger and bigger data sets, um, the computers got bigger. So we, we went with PC model, but we just made the computers bigger and bigger. We kept adding more stuff to them, uh, and as we wanted them more reliable, we added more redundant stuff to them. So this is a marketing brochure for this. This is a Lenovo something, nothing very interesting server. Um, but you can see here, this is the marketing brochure. It's got four hot swap power supplies. Uh, and this was pretty typical. You can, you can, a hard a power supply can fail while the computer's still running. You can realize, take it out, plug a different power supply in, keep going. Um, hot swap power supplies, hot swap fan, fans up here, whatever this thing down the left is, is all hot swap. These things in the front are all hot swap. So basically, you've got all this stuff where you, you've got um, a, a precious thing that has to keep running. And all around it, we have this growing gr redundant infrastructure so that you can hot swap all the things, plug them in and out, and keep the the, the core, the soul of the computer still running. Now this, yeah, this is a, a, a Lenovo System X850, X6, whatever that is. I made a note of it when I copied the photo. So we're hot swapping all the things. We're adding more redundancy at the hardware level. This worked okay, but you still got a problem. This, this still might fail. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many things you put in there, you still got to deal with the case where this breaks there's still going to be a fire. Like if one of these catches fire and fills the chassis with smoke, it's, it's not going to come back. Um, if, if it's in a rack and if the whole rack loses power, it doesn't matter how many redundant power supplies you had at this level. If it's in a building and the building has a fire, like you've still lost that whole, that whole set of computing equipment. So you still have to deal with the case where that fails. And it's just a numbers game, it just fails less often. Um, and also, you have doesn't matter how big you make this computer, at some point you're going to have a data set that doesn't fit in, that, in one computer. So you still have to deal with, with sharding your data, with spreading your data across multiple machines. And so as companies got bigger and bigger and the demands got bigger and bigger, more data, more availability, this approach just became infeasible. Lots of companies tried really hard to sell you a device that would meet whatever your needs were, but it just became impossible to do with a, with a, with a device. So. <coughs> this is, uh, I don't know, the 2000, 2005 kind of era. Um, uh, we used to call it grid computing um, a long time ago. I remember that term coming out, where we had loosely coupled machines. They weren't the Cray supercomputers. They were now loosely coupled machines that could fail separately without affecting each other. They weren't doing shared memory. They weren't doing, um, what do they call it, MPI? I can't remember what it's called. What was that thing where we used to do shared memory across machines to do um, <coughs> distributed computing? Uh, they, they were much more loosely coupled, much more independent from each other. And this allowed us to scale really large. So we had to deal with these problems anyway, large data scalability um, and, and hardware failure. And so once you've written software to solve those problems, you no longer need really uh, redundant, expensive hardware. So we kind of flipped. We went from putting more things into, into this precious box to do the opposite. The boxes are now not important at all and we've got clever software. Um, Google was a big player in this. Google really took this approach and ran with it. Um, uh, but so did other people. It wasn't just them. Part of this was we developed a whole set of new building blocks. 
we used to kind of use these ideas on the left. We used to have libraries. We used to have in-process linking things in. Now we were talking of the network. We now had microservices. We had remote procedure calls. Uh, now, when we talk about APIs, I think it's funny. People talk about API, and they just assume that means a remote API now. Um, uh, these sorts of particularly the key value stores and object stores, these became really important building blocks. Um, and this traditionally we'd use uh, something featureful like a SQL database, you know, Oracle database or MySQL um, or Postgres. And that, that idea of transactions and, and a table schema and things, they're very attractive features, but they're very hard to do at scale. So instead, when we go to the big scale computing, lots and lots of machines, we break that really into two separate camps. One has, has coherent uh, atomicity, and that's the key value stores. So I can put a value in, and I can get it out again. And that's about all. That's, that's the only feature it offers. <laughs> I can't do a search. I can't do index. I put, put a thing in with a key, and I, get a, I, and I get the value back again later on. But it's reliable. It's spread across multiple machines. It uses Paxos or Raft. Um, and it's very good at dealing with put a value in, get a value out and make sure you don't lose that data anywhere in the, in, the, in the process along the way. And then at the other scale, we have object stores, which are, you know, uh, S3, is a big Amazon, what everyone knows about, um, but lots of others. Um, and they are dumb and simple and scale to ridiculous sizes because all they do, <laughs> I store a thing, I'll probably get it out again later on, probably not straight away because there's lots of caching and stuff going on. Very, very relaxed consistency guarantees um, it's really all just about scale. And you couldn't do this with things like NFS before. Um, NFS uh, and, and traditional file systems generally have these ideas where I can write to a file, close the file, immediately open the file, and expect to see that thing I just wrote, which is quite a reasonable <laughs> statement to make. <laughs> but, but at a certain scale, that becomes really hard to guarantee that kind of read after write. Um, so object stores are very relaxed. They don't, you don't necessarily get that behavior. Um, so these new building blocks that allows us to scale really large. And, and even to the point where whole um, administration practices changed. So uh, we no longer talk about uh, in place. I don't SSH in and, and do a package upgrade. Instead, I replace the whole machine. Because this is an, this is an absolute statement of what should be on, on the disk. And I, my, my machine never deviates from that because it's always, boom, that's exactly what's running on that server. Um, and if I want to upgrade it, I, I effectively delete it and replace it with a whole other version. So I always know what's on there. And if I've got a thousand machines in my data center and I'm using this approach, I can say every single one of those machines is running pretty much bit for bit that image. Whereas if I'm using this version, the older, sort of smaller scale version, it's easy to get deviation. And uh, I know quite know if that machine was offline at the time that I upgraded all the others, and then it comes back, and then I do a following on upgrade, I no longer quite know what's running on there. It's some slightly different combination of upgraded packages. So whole, whole practices, administration practices also kind of evolved with this. So this is, this is a big change, big industry change. And of course, now we have data centers that look like this. This is a you know, typical Google um, picture of the Google data centers. Lots and lots and lots of machines. And the machines themselves are so unimportant, these don't even have cases on them. They certainly don't have redundant power supplies. If you're in a Google data center, you don't even turn on uh, um, journaling on your file system. Right? All you're doing is, is if you've got a, <laughs> a journal, you're just doubling your rights. And yet the data, if the data is only on one machine, it's not important. So who cares about doubling my rights to save one copy of data? Like, that's not where my redundancy is. My redundancy is at the, the object store level. The, the, some, right? It's already spread across multiple machines. Um, I, I upset people a lot by saying, well, can we turn this server off? Yes, of course you can. Just turn it off. But what if it's important? Oh, if it's important, it's not on one server. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've kind of gone back to this model now. We have one corporate user who's now using multiple machines. So we've kind of gone this whole spread of multiple users using one machine, user per machine, and then we've kind of gone the inverse version where we have multiple cheap computers, PC class computers, because they're the cheapest you can buy. And we have uh, effectively one corporate user, although that might be something like Google that then, or Amazon that, that on sells that. So this is sort of the evolution. This is the, the background that's happened here. Now, 
the software we write at home, the, 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 the free software, the, the scratch your own itch software, it kind of got stuck back in that Linux PC era. We still write software. If you look at most of the things that are packaged in a, in a you know, Debian distribution, most of that software is still written using those old building blocks. It's still reading and writing local files. It still has a setup process that involves running multiple steps, sort of interactively. Um, we have all those building blocks on the right-hand side in, in the free software world, but they're not used very much. They're used by the software that we write at work, the free software we write at work. So, so when I go to work every day, I spend most of my time well, working on Kubernetes, but, but I'm working with key value stores, I'm working with um, object stores, this sort of structure, this architecture of software that I work on in my, in my eight hours of work free software. And when I go home, my eight hours, I wish, of, of home free software, I'm writing traditional, like real, you know, 1970s era architecture software. And this, I don't know, I, I feel like this is getting worse. Like, it's, it's a success problem. We have lots of wonderful free software that we can work on at work now, but it's different. And it's diverging more and more, I feel, from what the kind of the home, the, the, the actual sort of classic free software. Um, and this, I feel this has a lot of effects. And I, and I had trouble putting words around this. Um, so I'm really happy I'm following um, the keynote this morning, Karen Sandler's keynote, because she did a much better job articulating what I was trying to say here. Um, there's a bunch of flow on secondary effects from this, which I feel in the long term uh, are a problem, are an issue. It's, it's, and it's partly a success problem. It's wonderful that we can go to work and work on open source software at work. But the fact that now we've got two camps of open source software and that the one that has a lot of the, the resources behind it, being the eight hours of, of workday, um, are going off in a direction that's a little bit different. It's kind of, and the, the features that we're getting as a result are different. So we're seeing more Apache rather than GPL, for example, because companies tend to be nervous about GPL and tend to be pro-Apache. So now a lot of projects are, are Apache based and there's a decreasing number, I feel, of GPL based software now. Um, you see, uh, yeah, the federated protocols. I'm, I'm one, of, one of the last big successful federated protocol was probably Git and it's done pretty well, but there hasn't been a lot of others. We don't have a good chat network anymore. We don't have these sorts of things are now becoming centralized services. Um, and there's a number of things, a number of problems that free software has typically been good at solving. Um, but it's very hard to put a business case around. It's very hard to turn into money. So when you ask a company to choose what projects they're going to work on, what open source projects is this open source friendly company going to work on, they're slightly different projects to what you would work on if you're at home without a profit motive. And, and the two that I find particularly in the Kubernetes sort of world, the Docker world, um, MultiArc. MultiArc support exists in Docker, but oh, it's rough. And if you compare that to something like Debian, um, wonderful support for multiple architectures, huge infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, a strong uh, support from the ground up within the community within Debian um, for that other architectures are important. Even though you can't make a business case around that, you know, your business case is always going to be seriously Intel and maybe ARM and then nothing else. Um, so there's a bunch of those extra parts around the workflow, which if this was a home free software would, would be being worked on, but they're real weaknesses in a lot of these new free software projects because they're corporate driven and they have a different set of priorities. So, anyway, so this is kind of where we are. So there's, uh, this, this is gross oversimplification, this slide, but it's kind of trying to just, this is where I'm thinking uh, about where we're up to with this. We have a bunch of, um, challenges in, in the software space, they, for, for a variety of reasons that work, free software architecture, those, that new world, that cloud native architecture, never quite caught on at home. And so we have these two diverging camps of, of free software. Um, and then this leads to a bunch of secondary, kind of difficult to put your finger on issues. Um, and so this is where my thinking was at. So this is kind of the historical context. So 
I mean, this world, to look at this going, oh, it'd be nice if there was some way to unify this and bring it all back together. And uh, I remember having a discussion with um, Josh Hesketh uh, quite a few LCAs ago uh, about maybe coming up with a new distribution that was all based around as a service. So we were providing free software based um, uh, services over the internet, but we'd run it in like a distribution community driven sort of project. Um, something and we're trying to come up with a way to sort of tackle this problem, this diverging camps. I didn't have good answers. All right, so I want to I sort of park this, this topic, this part of the discussion. And now we're going to talk about, if I can go to the next slide, now we're going to talk about Kubernetes. So I want to park that, I'm going to come back to it. All right. Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a project that came out of Google originally um, as a free software project. Um, it's now owned by uh, an organization known as the CNCF. It's uh, their flagship product, although they have a few other, their project, although they have a few others as well under that banner, um, Prometheus and, and some other things. Um, the name Kubernetes uh, is Greek. It's got something to do with pilot or captain. It's that sort of word. Um, it comes into Latin as gubernator with a G, and then into English is some quaint words like gubernatorial, if you follow the US elections, and uh, governor um, is a more normal English word. Uh, and also, apparently, Kubernetes comes through French into cybernetic. So it's actually quite a good, a good word for a computer project. Um, often abbreviated to K8S because it's annoying to type. It is, I like to think of it as Unix process as a service. You give it the things you want to run and it runs it. You give it effectively a Unix process. You say, here's the executable I want to run, here's the command line arguments, here's the environment, um, and it takes care of where and how that's actually going to run. And people get all excited about Docker and containers and what does that mean? And I have to sit them down and explain, it's just a process. It's just a forked child process, just like we're used to. When you run something under systemd and it runs that persistent process, if you look at that and what's running on the host at the end of it, that's pretty much identical to what happens when you run it through Docker. There's no, nothing magic. It's not different. It's not VM layers. It's not more or less stable or more or less reliable. It is just a forked process. Um, that has, uh, instead of just a cheroot, it's, it's done a, a namespace cheroot equivalent, but it's, it's really, it's old school Unix. Um, something that Kubernetes brought in is the idea of pods. So when it runs a container, uh, runs a, a Docker image or one of the Docker equivalents, um, it doesn't run it in isolation. It can run a group of them called a pod. And Kubernetes guarantees that those containers always run together always run on the same host, uh, are started and destroyed together. And because they're always running on the same host, they share the same, or they can, they can share file systems, so you can mount a volume into any one of those containers in that pod. Um, and the way Kubernetes sets them up, they're all running in the same network namespace. So they can talk to each other via localhost. They share the same idea of what localhost means. So you can run, a typical example would be to run a, um, uh, log, so you've got your main Apache server, for example, and then in another container you might run a log fetch or something, a uh, process that would pull up the logs from a shared volume and then push it off to your log saving architecture. Uh, yeah, got a nautical theme, all the logos are project names are nautical. Um, now, one of the things I like about Kubernetes is it's conceptually very simple. Um, I have trouble thinking about complicated things, so I try very hard to make, and, and, and I like projects that I can understand, that are simple, can fit in my head. So here's the general idea. We have one API server, or, or replicas, but this is basically a web server. It's taking in REST, HTTP requests and responses, and it talks, it translates that in, into etcd stores. So you send a put, I want to I wanna create an object here, and it turns it into an etcd, um, store operation, and then later on you come along, you do an HTTP GET, and it turns it into an NCD GET operation. Real simple. Uh, and then asynchronously, you have a whole bunch of controllers. And these controllers, they're just loops. They're big loops 
that go to the, AP, the API server and they say, okay, what's the latest version of this particular object? Right, I'm going to give me, I'm going to look at all of the objects of this particular type and then I'm going to try to make the world closer to what's described in an object. So I might say I want to run a, a service of this particular name and there's a, somewhere in here there's a service controller that looks at that and then tries to make that happen. And it's always just looping trying to make that happen. So it's very fault tolerant. If this it doesn't run right now or it's crashed or there's an error, then you can fix it, roll out a new version and then it'll just start with that left off. It'll just look at the latest version and go, right, that's what I should be doing. Try to make the world like that. Um, I've highlighted a few particular controllers here. The controller manager and scheduler are the important ones. They're, they're the ones that are needed to run all the other controllers. Um, and then on each host, you run a kubelet. And it's basically an agent that talks to the local Docker daemon or container D or cryo server or rocket or whatever technology you're using. Um, and it tells it what to run. But from an architecture point of view, it's just like the other controllers. It's just looking for a particular type of record that the API server is storing in etcd and it's making that happen. In that case, it's the pod. This pod should run on this host record and it just makes that happen. Um, etcd, if you're not familiar with it, is a key value store, uh, very much like console or Zookeeper. They're the sort of three big free software key value stores. Um, it uses Raft, uh, which is a an evolution, uh, a, a, re a rethink of the Paxos algorithm, but is otherwise conceptually very similar, uh, which just means you can run it on multiple hosts. You store something in there, it stores it on all the hosts reliably. Um, it waits till more than half of the hosts have acknowledged that right, and then it tells you, yes, it's, this is now safely stored. So I can, I run, it typically it'd run etcd with three or five nodes, and as so long as that write goes to more than half, you know it's secure within that etcd cluster. Yeah, very simple, very simple. One state store. And if, if you've looked at something like OpenStack, you'll understand just how simple it is. OpenStack is a dozen or so um, API server equivalents. Uh, it's got a dozen or so different places where data is stored. They might all be on one MySQL server, but they're all treated as separate tables and separate stores. Um, and these other controllers also, interestingly, are able to run in Kubernetes. So there's lots of kind of value add controllers, like even important ones like the DNS, internal DNS server, which actually run as regular Kubernetes jobs, um, which makes them very easy to manage. It also has a very simple network requirement. It only wants you to be able to forward layer three, so, so IP packets or IPv6, uh, from uh, a pod running somewhere on this machine to a pod running somewhere on another machine. Doesn't care how that happens. So there's lots of different ways of forwarding packets. The simplest, of course, is just a simple kernel root forward rule. Um, but you might have tunnels, you might have fancy layer two segmented something or others with VLANs and whatever, it doesn't matter. So long as you can forward a packet from here, have it go out and arrive over here somewhere, Kubernetes is happy. So this is, again, quite different to OpenStack, which demands you know, layer two and these sorts of things. Very, very simple. Um, very easy to provide in lots of different ways. In fact, if you were a large data center like Google scale, you would pick static routing, the simplest, dumbest approach, part of your machine life cycle. Every time I put this machine in, I have a, a whole lot of processes that I follow to make sure it's in the right place in the rack and it's recorded in my hardware inventory part of those processes would be, and I allocate this pod subnet to that machine. And so you would just make sure that your network fabric had routing rules set up, static routing rules, so that whenever a packet was destined for this prefix, it was routed down through the fabric to this, this machine. Very, very simple. So this is good because it's nice and flexible. Um, on the host, as I was saying, uh, we've moved to, the machines are now not important. The individual machines, we expect them to fail. So we've kind of inverted the stack from what it used to be in the days of redundant everything servers. Um, this arrow used to go the other way. We used to have the kernel was important, the, the host file system was important. Um, now we've kind of flipped it. Now the host is the least important part. 
there's no reason you would ever do a backup of the host file system in a Kubernetes cluster. It's just not interesting. Um, the only thing you care about is the application data, which is stored somewhere else on a network storage device of some sort, or some sort of redundant style across multiple nodes. Um, the hardware itself, you can turn the machine off without even telling anyone. And Kubernetes will cope. Um, if you need to reboot the kernel, that's easy. You just take the machine down, reboot it, bring it back up again. These, like, these are easy problems down here. If you want to replace the application, that's also OK, um, because the data is stored somewhere else. So kind of importance goes the other way now. This is really, really nice for uh, upgrades. I can do upgrades of pretty much any magnitude at the host level, drain the machine, do whatever I want to the machine. I can replace the file system, I can reboot it, I can put a kernel out there, whatever, and then when I'm finished, I undrain it and it goes back to the cluster. So this makes my admin tasks stupendously simple. Everything looks like a rolling upgrade across the cluster. It doesn't matter whether it's a, I've got a new version of some unimportant package, or I've got like a new libc, or a whole new kernel that needs a reboot. Doesn't matter. They all have the same cookie cutter process. Uh, yeah, and so, um, anyway, yeah, the, it's application focused. So we get the container basically captures the application we want to run. So it's it's an executable. It's environment variables. It's command line arguments. All those things you think of as application concerns. Now, getting a little bit more detailed, Kubernetes looks, these is what the objects look like. They're, they're in JSON, but YAMLs are, are shorter to put on the slide. Um, they all have this API version kind up the top there that tells me what sort of object this is. In this case, it's a deployment object. Um, this is a deployment object for Nginx. It's going to have two replicas. Um, there's the image version that I'm running down there, the Nginx 179, and it's going to listen on port 80. There's nothing really revolutionary there. But have a look what I'm not describing there. I haven't talked about what operating system I'm putting, on, putting it on. I haven't talked about kernel versions. I haven't talked about where I want to run it. All of these host level concerns are taken care of automatically by Kubernetes. Okay, this is really application level. Um, there's the equivalent command on the right there, kubectl. Um, so that looks like I can run a command and that happens. But if I'm doing this, this from a, from a, a team-based admin, I'm going to do it using the left-hand approach where I store it in Git and, and GitOps workflows and all those wonderful things. Um, but either approach is fine. There's a bunch of other useful commands that you want to look into if you're doing this. The describe shows you what's running. Um, and logs tells you the logs of the container. These are useful debugging tools. And then this is good. Run and exec are good for just quick testing out things um, in the cluster. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. There's a bunch of these objects that I create for different tasks. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all because that's what the documentation is for. But that's just a feel for what's out there. And there's a whole lot of other objects that Kubernetes knows about. And from that earlier slide, these are all just controllers. Somewhere in Kubernetes is a controller looking for that type of object and making that thing happen when it sees one of them. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through those in detail. Um, now, at the, at the machine lifecycle level, hardware failure is not an emergency. It, it boggles my mind in this day. We've conducted this experiment for decades now, and I've got news for you all. The conclusion is hardware fails. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what? <laughs> yes, that's right. And, and I've got some bad news about Santa Claus, too. Um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, what, what still surprises me is that as software developers, like, we treat hardware failure as an exceptional situation. And it's not. It's normal. <laughs> so when a bit of hardware fails, like every time, if you're running a website, Every time a query comes in and you serve back a, a successful 200 response, you don't page someone. <laughs> that's not an emergency. That's normal. In the same way, if a server dies, you shouldn't page anyone because that's normal. You need to have built a system where that becomes normal. Okay? And Kubernetes is one of the first big projects I've seen in the free software world that makes that possible. We had tools before, orchestration tools, uh, Puppet Chef, Ansible. Uh, and other things in that class. 
they were, you ran them once, and then they exited. They helped you set up, but then they stopped. They didn't deal with the hardware failure is normal case. Kubernetes, on the other hand, is always actively managing. Because it knows what application I'm running, it's always health checking, it's actively managing them. It knows when they die and come back, it knows to reschedule them somewhere else. So hardware failure, still, you still got to do so, you have to replace the hardware eventually, but it's no longer an emergency. You don't have to get paged for it. You just turn up on Monday at 9 a.m. and go, oh, look, three machines died over the weekend. Oh, better go replace them. It's just part of your regular work now. Um, and as part of that, it separates the concerns. And this is a big deal in co corporate environments where you've now got a separate teams can work very efficiently with each other without um, um, stepping on each other's toes. And this brings us back around to the home Kubernetes cluster. So restoring that, that previous conversation about the diverging free software stacks, uh, free software communities. I had this, to be thinking about this problem and uh, think about where we're up to and, you know, oh, I wish there was, I could see some way out of this kind of um, progression. And so I looked at, this is, this is my little home uh, file server machine at home. And ev everyone, pretty much everyone here, I'm guessing, has some sort of a RAID set up at home. It's kind of, it, it used to be a, a, a high-powered enterprise feature, and now it's, it's a very normal power user feature. If you're, if you're a technically sav savvy person with some slightly advanced infrastructure at home, you've probably got something like this. And it's so boring and simple and obvious. And I thought, whoa, hang on. Why don't we do the same with compute? The same things, the same reasons that drove companies to follow that model also apply at home. We now have decent hardware that's cheap. We now have uh, the same issues of, of hardware failure and elastic hardware. I want to add and remove machines over time easily. My hardware dies and wants to be replaced. Like all these same pressures driving it also apply at home. So my idea was let's, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's make a, a distro sort of model. We use that separation of concerns approach to get uh, the, uh, a, a project, a community, a, a distribution idea that's providing the underneath layer and they'll provide up to the Kubernetes layer. And then from Kubernetes up, it's now whatever I want to run at home. Um, and this is actually quite achievable. Uh, and because of this, it's got to be automatic maintenance and easy upgrades uh, have to be very simple. Or else it's just not going to catch on. So here we go. I've got a budget of about 100 bucks. That's in the, in the cheap, too cheap to care too much about. And this necessarily means ARM machines. Um, computers. I need three. For my HCD cluster, I need at least three machines in order to be able to deal with a failure in any of them. And when you multiply everything by three, suddenly you care a bit more about the price. So if I could get a, a NUC device or something there, you know, a cheap Intel device, it's $100, $200 times three, that's actually real money now. So I have to look at ARM class hardware. Uh, I bought banana pies because I did this a few years ago and uh, nowadays I probably pick up Pine64 or something. Um, but they're about 30 bucks each. That's about the budget. Um, and I assume a home network, assume Ethernet, and then I try to be very normal because I don't want to put much work into it. I want to just draw on what the standard Kubernetes people are doing. So I also have uh, high school age children, um, which means I have to keep buying about $500 price point laptops for them and they keep breaking them. So I have a growing supply of laptops with dead screens and missing F12 keys. Apparently that was a thing. You'd steal each other's F12 key. Uh, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, they're all x86 class. None of them are great. Um, and so I'm running CoreOS. I really like the CoreOS model. They've got the AB upgrades, um, automatic upgrades. So I'll download a new one and just flip to the new version automatically. Um, and then my control plane, as I was saying, has to be kind of ARM class. This photo didn't work very well because the LEDs are really bright and it confused my camera. Um, so it's quite dark. I had to turn it up. This is literally a photo of my desk. You can see I put a lot of work into making it neat before taking the photo. Um, there's my three banana pies that have my etcd cluster across them and they're running those, those core Kubernetes jobs, the API servers, the scheduler and the controller manager. Um, and uh, I discovered that CoreOS didn't work on ARM32. I had to go porting it and said, that's too hard. So I wrote my own operating system instead. Um, <laughs> Containos. <laughs> it's uh, built on Open Embedded. Open Embedded is amazing. I'd love to give a whole talk about that one day. Um, 
So this is smaller, better, faster than CoreOS. It's more portable, more operating systems. You, you're welcome to use it. It's, it's cool. Um, and yeah, so then I had a couple of things I had to adapt. Um, those, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, there's a few kind of core building blocks. One of them is a persistent volume. Whenever you have data you actually care about, you store it in a persistent volume object, um, which is an abstraction for whatever remote network attached storage thing. Um, if you're on Amazon, it turns into EBS volumes. If you're on Google, it turns into what do they call them, persistent disks. Um, in my case, uh, I've got my RAID NFS server thing, so I just turn them into NFS storage. So I run, I create this object that tells Kubernetes, by the way, there's a storage class object, which I called managed NFS storage, it's a bit long to type, I should have picked a shorter name, um, and I'm making it the default. So then I don't have to, in all my other bits of config, I don't have to say what it is, I just say, I want persistent volume, and it knows that this is a default, it should just do that. And on the right, you don't have to look too closely, on the right is the deployment, an actual controller that runs that looks for anything that wants NFS storage, and on the fly, it creates a subdirectory and mounts it and attaches it, and my job uses it. Everything's wonderful. Really, really nice, really simple, um, and not anything revolutionary in Kubernetes world. Um, one of the other building blocks is a service. Um, so I use for this, I chose KeepAliveD. Someone's written a thing called KeepAliveDVIP, which takes the a config file on the left there uh, in the form of a config map. And it says, anytime you see, it runs keep alive D, uh, anytime you see something coming into that address, you should forward it on to that service. Um, and again, like, these are just pointers. If you want to go learn about these, go look up the name. You'll find more documentation that I'm going to try to put on a slide about these projects. Um, and on the right there, I put it as a more interesting example of what you can do with a deployment. So this is running in the host network namespace um, in a privileged context. It's uh, a slightly more example of what you can describe there. Ingress was a bit complicated. Uh, Ingress, the object is kind of a reverse proxy. It's the Nginx abstraction. Um, I saw I use a combi combination of KeepAliveD and Nginx, and I've got Let's Encrypt running. Um, so I get TLS certificates automatically. And I have two separate setups, one for if you're coming in from outside my network, so I can run webhooks and things. So I have it set up so that I can say, hey, Google, something, something, something. and the Google Assistant will talk to if this and that, which will talk to something else, which sends a webhook to my thing, which comes into my home network via here, which then hits the Nginx, which then keep live D, which then Kubernetes, which then, and then it turns my television on. <laughs> um, and then I have a separate internal one for just simple stuff, like if I want to go to the Prometheus dashboard or something, and I don't have to, I don't want to worry about security and stuff like that. Um, so, last couple of slides. Um, the good news is it all works. This works. I've been running it for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's in production. Uh, again, high school age kids, my wife's a teacher, so for production for me means printing. Um, <laughs> printing works and has been running through this system for a couple of months now. Um, I have a really nice install setup for the, for the laptops. I run all that in Kubernetes. I run a DH, um, DHCP proxy and uh, TFTP server as Kubernetes jobs, so I can just plug a, a laptop in, pixie boot it, bam, 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 I'm into a CoreOS install. Um, I, yeah, Intel staged a nice demonstration for me. Um, meltdown upgrade rolled out across my Kubernetes nodes uh, without me having to do a thing, um, which was really nice. Um, and there's some stuff I need to work on still, mostly around security. The big thing with the banana pies is the CPU couldn't keep up with the TLS encryption on the gRPC connections. So I had to turn off TLS encryption, which is actually a pretty big hole. Um, and that's where you can go about things. So I'm out of time. I don't have time to deal with questions, but I'm really happy to talk about this stuff. Um, there's a bunch of links to other things you can go talk about, uh, find out about this. I have all of my home network config is up here. This is all of the Kubernetes configs for all the jobs I'm running. You can just go and look at it. Um, and this is in a tool called kubeconfig, which is what I actually write in my day job. Um, it's just a, a generator for the JSON objects rather than having to write them out by scratch. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gus. <laughs> okay, we have nine minutes, and then our next talk will be in here uh, with Casey Shawfler. So uh, thank you very much. Either stay or leave. Up to you. And uh, <laughs> Gus will be in Hawaiian shirts all week. So Tracy Round a week. I'm very happy to talk about this stuff. And if people are interested or want to know about next steps or anything like that, um, yeah. I'm very happy to talk about it.